Hello and welcome to the KTH School of Architecture. Uh, for you who are sitting here are the ones who are following us live by the website uh, from the triangle. Hello. Uh, my name is Jesus Aspeitia. I'm the head of the third year of I'm the bachelor project here in the School of Architecture. And before I introduce all today's guests, I would like just some remarks. Uh, first, I would like to thank the board of the school for the support in this operation, I would say, and as well for Balfas and Balenio Sipping Company, who is support us really economically. So thank you for them. And I would like to say as well, when there's so many people here, about, uh, about the schedule that come in the next weeks. The 14th of November, we have Anton Garcia Abril here having a lecture. And the 18th of November, we have Christian Keres here as well in the history school. So you are really, really welcome as well. Just follow on the website about the times and so on. Uh, and as we said, after the lecture will be some refreshments, some French wine and Swedish water, just in the entrance. Uh, and we have the possibility to mingle with Stan Allen there outside. As well, uh, you can already read the first tr uh, the translation of his text uh, from object to field into Swedish. It's on the walls that will be published from the KTH School of Architecture at the spring 2012, 12, isn't it? Nice. And our guest, for me, it's uh, really, really, really a honor to have here uh, Stan Allen, who is our guest today. I have to say, if I talk about it personally, that uh, Stan's texts always have been a part in my education as well in my professional career. About the topics about uh, field figures and hierarchies has become a popular uh, part of the uh, syllabus of many schools of architecture in the, in the world. And it's, as I said, it's really a honor. Uh, I still keep a lot of distance all the time when I was thinking about Stan Allen, you know, about the overseas distance and so on. But it was uh, last January, it was a really cold winter time here in Sweden. It was like minus 15 degrees. So I was having a really nice dinner with a friend. So by the way, it's a friend as well of Stan. And then he convinced me to take the step and just uh, sent a letter, a really handwritten letter to Stan to invite him. So I get the, courage, the energy to do it, and I'm really happy that it worked. So I should thanks as well to Luis Mancilla, who encouraged me to do it that. Uh, I would like to thank about Stan, not just to be here, also as well to have the time to say hello to some of my students of the third year in the studio, and to talk about a bit how it works, the education in the USA, and the projects here in Stockholm. So, but now it's time for our guest, Stan Allen, American architect, theorist, and dean of the School of Architecture at Princeton University. Well, welcome, Stan. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. The audio is working okay. Everyone can hear? So, good. Um, well, listen, uh, thank you, Jesus, for the introduction to uh, Eureka, who was a student of mine many years ago. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, to, to visit uh, Stockholm. Um, the ostensible occasion for this series of lectures is the recent publication of this book, Landform Building. And uh, the way the le lecture is structured is, is basically in three parts. Um, I have this predilection for doing things in threes. Uh, and what I want to do first is to give you a very quick overview, a kind of cross-section, a kind of snapshot of some of the work that, that we've been doing in the office in, say, the past three, three, three or four years, um, in which we were working simultaneously on large-scale projects that would fall uh, into this category of landscape urbanism. But at the same time, we were working on uh, quite small projects, such as this single-family house, which was finished in 2008, and was actually designed, uh, interestingly enough, uh, about 10 years before. Um, an anecdote, I had, a, I had a meeting with a client to present the design development drawings on September 11th, 2001 in my lower Manhattan office, and that meeting never happened. But 
project was put on hold and finally started construction around 2005, and the house was finished in 2008. Uh, but the reason I show it in this context is it was the, the beginning of this interest in the figure, the vertical figure of the house on the landscape. Um, the profile of the house against the, the sky, uh, even you could say some reference to the sort of traditional roof forms and the, and the, the, uh, uh, the, the chimney here. Um, part, it was a very small site so that uh, the idea that the house could be expansive vertically uh, as opposed to the horizontal extension of the field uh, was very important at the time. Uh, there's, a, there's a strong differentiation between the uh, private side, very blank, coming right down to the ground, and then the, the, uh, the back of the house where it's lifted up on a, almost a more conventional kind of, kind of piloti uh, response to the private spaces of the, of the house. Um, and this attention to the, to the vertical profile, the kind of iconic presence of the house on the uh, landscape has continued um, with a house that we're designing for an a oceanfront site in the Philippines where on a very steep site we're creating a kind of uh, artificial landscape halfway down the hill, uh, but then uh, the view of the house from the street uh, emphasizes what in this case are uh, wind scoops um, that are uh, re related to working with the, the kind of extreme tropical climate in that, uh, uh, in that uh, area. Uh, the house is, is uh, currently on hold, but we hope it will uh, be built. Um, this next project, which also was started around 99 and 2000, put on hold and uh, moved forward. It was completed, I think, in 2009. Um, it was really more about working with, uh, in this case, a designed urban context. Uh, this is about an, uh, an hour north of Seoul, Korea. Paju Book City is uh, the name of the um, area where the, the project is located. Uh, H. Sang Sung is the master plan architect. This is his model. Uh, when I visited the site in 99, um, looked like that. There were no buildings at all. Um, our project was put on hold. I came back in 2008, 2007, and there were 163 buildings built on site. So that sense of how do you deal with these cities that are built from scratch, and how do you give, how do you make your building both fit into the logic of that new urban fabric, but also uh, stand out? Uh, there were a, a very strict set of design guidelines, and you see a little bit how we were sort of negotiating uh, with that, uh, trying to create uh, some uh, public space, kind of courtyard space on the site. Um, the site, the side of the site which is um, more facing the, the natural uh, landscape. Uh, the, the working metaphor for the overall site planning is that of, a, of an urban wetland. Um, and the building becomes uh, a bit more iconic from that face. Uh, here you see in the site plan, uh, there's a kind of entry courtyard here. It's a corner site. This is the wetland, and that's the primary entry here. So one of the important things about the building, you can see it's a very... Uh, our response to this explosion of building on site was to make a building that, that was very sober, very simple, uh, and the articulation could occur at a finer-grained uh, scale. Uh, so, for example, the, the, the importance of bringing everybody from the courtyard and the primary entry to a central point of entry, which you see here, which co coincides with a vertical uh, shaft uh, of light in the project, uh, and then to activate the perimeter of the building by bringing all the internal circulation to the perimeter, and as uh, the stairs make their way up the building, the curtain wall peels back to reveal uh, the stone base of the building uh, that, that ties it back to the site itself. So you see here, for example, the way it's, the figure is kind of eroded from below rather than given an iconic profile from above. 
And then to articulate the surface of the uh, curtain wall itself, it's a quite deep curtain wall with then a series of sliding panels that are infilled with color uh, panels. Um, and uh, the working metaphor here, all of these buildings are for publishing companies, was a bit like the spines of books uh, in, a, in a bookshelf. Um, and of course, those panels are moving, so that there's, there, there's always a kind of dynamic, uh, changing colored uh, facade to the, to the building uh, itself. Um, an another one of these smaller projects that was built around the same period of time, also in the Philippines, uh, this is a small chapel. It was built for an organization that uh, takes care of uh, orphaned and handicapped children. Uh, the, the, the name of the organization is the Chosen Children's Village. Um, we, this was a pro bono project. Uh, they told us they couldn't pay us a fee. They didn't have a big budget to build anything, but they would basically build whatever we drew. And what architect can resist that? So uh, the project has a very important location. This is the, this is the campus um, where there are numerous dormitories and classroom buildings. This is the access road, and as you can see from this photograph, I mean, this is outside of Manila in the Philippines. It's quite a, uh, a rough landscape. And the chapel forms a kind of gateway to the complex itself built on a former uh, parking lot. Now, there were a number of very key restraints here. First of all, it had to be built inexpensively. Um, the Philippines is a high seismic zone, uh, and of course it gets torrential rains. Uh, and of course, with the, the, the population of children that would be using this chapel, it was very, very important to keep it very open to uh, the landscape. Um, uh, so you can see the way that the outdoor paving goes right into the chapel, the big pivoting doors, Really, really make the boundary between inside and outside very porous. What I like about this, this, this building is not really a building. It has no electrical systems. It has no, no mechanical ventilation. Uh, there's no glass in the windows. Uh, when it rains, the rain comes right in. And the paving inside is an outdoor paving, so the water is just swept out. So it's really more really of a pavilion than a, than a building per se. And, and that's reflected in the plan as well, which is just a single line which weaves in and out for structural reasons, gives the walls more stability in the earthquake zone, um, and folds back on itself uh, to create the, uh, the private spaces such as they are uh, within, uh, within the chapel. And then um, you, you can see again this paving. Those are the doors when they're closed. That's the outdoor, uh, uh, the, uh, this beautiful acacia tree which had to be preserved and the rhythm of the structure and the openness here. And then you see the way in which the light is brought in, filtered from behind the altar and then through the depth of the structure uh, here, uh, giving that sense again of a kind of connection between the inside and outside um, and the kind of provisionality of the enclosure of the space at the same time that it maintains this strong uh, focus towards uh, the altar itself. Um, and has become actually very important to the local uh, community, uh, this, this particular building. Now, that's the low end of the scale, these projects. And, but at the same time, we were working on very, very large scale projects. Projects that fit within this uh, larger category that I've been associated with of, of landscape uh, urbanism. Um, this was a project which we started working on in uh, 2008, the beginning of 2008, and the master plan was finished in uh, 2010. Um, this is for the city of Taichung, uh, the sort of second city in Taiwan. It's about an hour south of Taipei on the high-speed railroad, which ends up here. And you can see the historic center of Taipei is, uh, sorry, Taichung is here, and the city has grown on a kind of radial pattern. And the municipal airport that was built in the 40s um, has uh, been abandoned, and a new airport has been built further up. So the city has sort of grown up to encompass the, the, the airport. And then when the airport left, you had this vast, empty site. Uh, and we were, we were given the, the mandate to 
uh, think about how that site could, could be redeveloped and become a part of the city over time. It's about um, uh, 240 hectares. Uh, it's about as close to a tabula rasa as you could possibly get. There's, there's less than a meter of level change over the course of the entire uh, site. Um, and uh, there was a very uh, charismatic mayor at the time, who, and the program he gave us was one-third green, one-third culture, and one-third commercial development. Now, uh, one of the important lessons from landscape urbanism is not only, of course, to make the void spaces of the city generative in, in the urban plan, but also to think strategically and think about the problems of, of implementation. On a site this large, not only could, as, as the architects of the master plan, uh, would, would probably be un, unable to actually control the entire development of the site, you wouldn't want a single architect to design that much of the city. The beauty of cities is that they're designed and they, they are produced by, by many different agents. So what we proposed is that what we could control, what the city could control, are the open spaces and the infrastructure, the roadways and, and the park. And we used the roadway, a, a connection actually out to the uh, new airport, and the sweeping curves of the roadway would uh, map out a, 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 a green space, which would become the new figure, the new identity for uh, the site. So if our project was successful, we would actually erase the boundary of the old airport and let the city grow up to define this new figure over time. So the city fabric is properly built by others, and we only exercise very loose control over that. Also, we built in a level of uncertainty. Uh, again, there's a 15, even 20 year process of implementation here. We don't know what the economy, what the technology, what the nature of the city will be like in 15 or 20 years. So uh, there's an intrinsic flexibility to working with these uh, open spaces. Uh, this is the final uh, uh, version which has been implemented in the city's master plan. Um, where you have a figural form uh, for the park and then the proposition that the city forms these distinctive neighborhoods that then grow up uh, to define that figure over time and then a series of uh, buildings at the north end of the site with specific functions related to the infrastructure that help to create a sense of kind of gateway, bringing the park up on top of those buildings, letting the park flow uh, underneath uh, and then programming the open spaces uh, as the primary uh, uh, generator of uh, the I new identity of the site uh, itself. So that this kind of idea of a density heat map that we couldn't specify completely, we could only approximate uh, the kind of gradient of uh, how that development would happen uh, over time. And of course, there are traditional tools with typologies, for example, uh, that we could use and uh, design regulation so that the, the, the tools for the fabric are, are let's say, more uh, conventional. And then the counterpoint to those two systems is the design of a very specific series of monumental buildings at the north end of the site, uh, convention uh, hall, uh, small uh, stadium arena, and a transportation hub here and the three towers there that uh, you would see from the car in motion and the, the parallax perception of those towers, again, creating that dynamic sense of identity for the uh, park. Now, a um, project like this has been accepted by the city as in the process of being implemented, but it's a long process and it involves many, many different hands and your, your level of control is, is, is quite minimal. We um, proposed to the mayor that um, once the master plan was accepted, it would be great to get people onto the site uh, to show what was proposed on the site and have people be able to observe the process of construction. Um, mayor thought this was a great idea. They appropriated some money. Um, but they didn't appropriate enough money to build a freestanding building. We did a, we did a series of, of studies, sketches. We had ideas for a kind of freestanding pavilion. Really like this notion of a 
of, of the pavilion to, to, to show, uh, create these uh, sort of overlooks uh, on the site. But it was one of those instances where not having a good budget in the end was much more interesting. Um, because we couldn't afford to build, build a freestanding building, we were encouraged to look at some of the buildings that already existed on the site, uh, one of which was this uh, maintenance hangar uh, built in the 1950s, a uh, big kind of industrial space, uh, had very heavy concrete slab, it had to support air aircraft, uh, it could certainly support a temporary pavilion. Uh, it's a roofed space, so we didn't have to worry about keeping the water out. And not only did it solve the pragmatic problems, it, it also allowed us to key into the history of the site as an airport in a much more explicit way, and also to develop a relationship between the temporary pavilion and this uh, big uh, industrial space. Um, so this is, the, this is the project. It was inaugurated about nine months ago, last uh, February. Um, it will be up for two years. Um, and as you can see, we built a big bamboo pavilion inside uh, this vast uh, airplane hangar existing on site. Um, we, when we were faced with the problem of building this project quickly and with a minimal budget, of course the first thing we thought about was the tradition all over Asia of using bamboo scaffolding um, when buildings are under construction. Um, it's quick, it's locally available, it's, very, it's actually very strong and flexible, um, and it it's, was a, somehow a technology that they knew. It, it, it seemed also appropriate from a kind of cultural perspective. Interestingly enough, we presented all that to the city planning people in, in Taichung, and they said, oh, no, 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 in Taichung, we're modern. We use metal scaffolding. Um, they were convinced, ultimately, obviously, to use the bamboo, um, but the arguments had to be of a different uh, nature. So our working premise is that we create this dense bamboo forest, which we then carve out the void spaces and the platform uh, for the exhibition route. Um, now, the other issue is that, um, although it certainly would have been practical to, to, to build the platforms uh, with the bamboo scaffolding. Bamboo is very strong. It's actually, actually per square centimeter stronger than steel. Um, the building codes wouldn't, have, wouldn't allow it, so uh, there is a, a metal structure which supports the primary platform, and then you can see the kind of uh, risers, auditorium risers and stair, grand stair that goes up to the uh, overlook. But then we wrap the whole thing with up to three meters of bamboo uh, as a kind of thick skin, and then, um, then uh, skin that whole thing uh, continuously with like a kind of woven uh, bamboo skin. So this is the, this is the pavilion inside of the space of the hangar. Uh, it's the equivalent of three stories high. You, uh, you enter on the lower level here, where there are re reception multimedia. You take uh, this... this we just got these photographs back from uh, Iwan Vaughn, and I, I love the way that Iwan always shows the buildings activated by uh, the school groups and the, the, the masses of people. Um, this is that lower level uh, introductory area, the stairway with the light from above leading you up, uh, the way in which it was very important for us in this building to make the temporary quality of the building thematic. Uh, there's a great opportunity uh, someone called John Whiteman, who nobody probably remembers, used to say that the pavilion is the essay form of architecture. That you can be more experimental in a pavilion because it has a shorter life lifespan. So, so we we didn't didn't want to try and allude to permanence and stability in this, but but use always lightweight materials that would make thematic the idea that this building has a a two year uh, lifespan. So. You see some of those details with the fabric, the depth of the bamboo scaffolding, the way the openings are made, and then the primary exhibition level upstairs and the bleachers that bring you up to the overlook so you can watch the process of, of construction, again, used by the so, sort of school groups. The views from the pavilion out to the hangar, so you're always aware of the relationship between this industrial building and the temporary building. Um, and 
uh, the, the, the sense that we could create a, a large object uh, that still, because of the use of bamboo, had a kind of intimacy here was, was very important uh, uh, to us. And it's very actively used, has uh, very much become part of the kind of, kind of cultural landscape of uh, tai chung. Um, lit, little coda to this project. Um, this is a uh, small pavilion that we did for the Chengdu Biennial, opened in September, uh, where we, we used the exact same system. But there's something about these biennials that always bothers me. You, you build these pavilions, and because they're never occupied, there's, there's never any sense of sort of life to the, to the project. So uh, our proposition, uh, we, we couldn't make an occupiable building, uh, but we made an aviary, so at least it's populated by birds. So, uh, so the, the pavilion uh, actually has this small population of native birds that uh, will, will live there for the, for the, the duration of the, uh, of the exhibition. So, okay, so that's the, that's the kind of um, backdrop to the work on the Landform Building book. Um, this, in, in some sense, looking for a conceptual framework to, to navigate between the very large-scale work in landscape and landscape urbanism and the continuing interest in the building as a, a, a distinct object, uh, the, the agency of the kind of compact uh, building form. Um, so this, the, the book was uh, based on a conference that took place at Princeton in the spring of 2009, and then we took two years really to develop and curate that material. Um, and uh, the book came out um, this, uh, this summer, and I encourage you all to buy a copy. So um, it's, a, it's a very dense, heavy book. There's a lot of material uh, in the book. And, and, and I'm not going to try and go through the whole contents. I'd have you here all evening. Uh, I really just want to give a little bit of the, the kind of background to the thinking and the, the, the framing of this. And it really goes back to the period of the uh, middle 1990s. Um, and on the one hand, there was a kind of formal similarity between the introduction of a curvilinear formal vocabulary in architecture at that time. This Frank Gehry's Vitra Museum was, um, uh, I think it was finished around 89. Um, and uh, this also coincided with the, the, the early emergence of digital technologies. Uh, that made it possible to start modeling those complex curvilinear uh, forms. Uh, and uh, th there were many, many instances in which ar architects sort of fell in love with the language of landscape. Um, I was on a conference with Winnie Moss some, sometime around this. It's actually the first time I ever met Winnie, and he, this was sort of 1996. He said, he said you know, Architects today use the word landscape as, as, as often as Americans use the word fuck. So uh, there was somehow this notion that the landscape answered to many things that architects were, were interested in in the middle uh, 1990s. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what, what I think those things were. But the other thing, let's say from the perspective of 2009, was to take stock of all of the building production that really did seem to be working with some sort of mimetic relationship between architecture and uh, landscape. This is Toyo Ito's crematorium. Um, this was a shot from the opening and when people were allowed to walk on the roof. And you see the very obvious uh, formal uh, echoing between the roof and the landscape. Um, uh, more mainstream projects, such as Renzo Piano's uh, science library. Peter Eisenman's uh, building in, in Santiago. Um, this is a work by the, the young Madrid firm, uh, Amid. Uh, this is actually a project, a competition project of theirs for a, a building in the States. Uh, it's a kind of mountain of roses. Uh, um, so this, so certainly looking around, uh, and I could have given you 30 other examples of the ways in which our architects were looking to landscape for, uh, for kind of formal uh, inspiration. But I think if we go back to this thinking in the, in, in, in the 90s, really, it, it was less to do with formal relationships to landscape 
and more to do with the generative and performative uh, uh, potentials of landscape. Uh, this is uh, a screenshot from a digital animation done by a geologist at MIT named Taylor Perron, and he's writing algorithms that will simulate the processes of evolution and uh, uh, sorry, uh, erosion and resistance in, in the landscape. Um, and it, this coincided with the interest among architects in diagrams. And so if you take a building like FOA's Yokohama Port Terminal, designed in the middle uh, 1990s, even though it wasn't realized till uh, 2003, the idea, and, and this is a building which is nothing if not an artificial landscape. Uh, there, was an, there was this idea that the connective potential of the warped landscape surface could be repurposed to, re, to rethink uh, the, the, the infrastructure of the port terminal. Um, and I would say in many ways that this building was the kind of culmination of that thinking that worked through diagrammatic operations, the, uh, the potential of the warped surface made possible by new computer technologies, um, and the, the, the notion also of the kind of open, indeterminate program that landscape makes possible. Uh, the notion that you can direct movement and you can create pockets of space without absolutely specifying a program on a kind of artificial landscape like this. So, so again, in, in some ways, very powerful project, very convincing project, but also one which seems to bring a certain chapter to a close. You know, when the definitive project is built, the question is always, where do you go from here? Uh, another, another work from that time, um, Winnie Moss, M MVRDV, um, working with the deep uh, floor plate and then introducing landscape-like configurations to the architecture with the proposition that over time, the users of the VPRO, the media company in the Netherlands, would, would sort of evolve new working landscapes within the kind of larger uh, social ecology of the, of the company. So just to run then quickly through what were some of these points of reference, the, the, the points of intersection between landscape and architecture around that time. Of course, the problem of the artificial and the natural. Um, and uh, if we look at the history of landscape architecture, of course, uh, even though we, we might look at Central Park today and think of it as a natural landscape, it's, it's, a, it's, an it's a piece of engineering. It's a, it's a completely constructed artificial landscape. This, this is, in fact, uh, the construction of Central Park and uh, some of the uh, infrastructural work necessary. Uh, I always love this image of Olmsted's tree-moving machine designed for his other great New York Park, uh, Prospect Park. Um, or in more recent histories, um, overlooked projects from the 1960s, such as Jean Renaudy's uh, housing in, in Paris, where the, the, the natural landscape is, is now growing up and over these uh, terraces. Or uh, Diller Scofidio's Blur Building, the notion that you're inhabiting uh, a, 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 a natural phenomenon as a kind of architectural proposition. Now, the other very important point of intersection ha is, had to do with questions of surface. This was where the experimental work of architects in the 90s and the emerging practices of landscape urbanism explicitly intersected. And uh, this is a photograph uh, from the Book of Aerial Photographs uh, Jim Corner and Alec McLean produced called Taking Measures Across America. And one of the things we learned from somebody like Jim Corner, landscape architect and, and uh, key figure in landscape urbanism, is to look, he, he likes to say you, you need to look at the landscape from the point of view of a farmer. So thinking about the patterns that you would use for cultivation, thinking about what areas will be wetter, what areas will be drier, uh, thinking about what areas receive sun, what areas uh, are going to be in shadow. So thinking about, again, thinking about the surface as a kind of performative diagram. And then, uh, in fact, this is a project that Jim and I did in 2001 for a competition for Downsview Park, where we were, we were explicitly shaping the landscape to create local uh, microhabitats that would, would perform differently depending on the, the, the conditions of wetness and dryness. 
Uh, Riser and Umamoto, 1998, for the West Side uh, project, where taking those kind of landscape-like configurations, a sort of furrowed landscape, and turning it into a kind of large uh, infrastructural uh, roof. And then, of course, the, the, the realization of really similar ideas at a much smaller scale in the High Line in New York, a collaborative project of Diller Scafidio and Jim Corner uh, field operations, uh, which, which has a certain debt to the, the Riser Umamoto project of, of, of 1998. So, um, so this, this is sort of landscape urbanism or landscape infrastructure as it is currently practiced uh, today. Um, I think another point that became very, very important in the landscape architecture intersection had to do with uh, the notion of a kind of indeterminate program. Um, that the horizontal surface, the horizontal field, is the place where the program uh, plays itself out. Um, it's an Andreas Gursky photograph. Um, and you see that in a project I'm going to show in a little bit greater detail later. Uh, Manfredi and Weiss's um, Olympic Sculpture Park in Seattle. And then finally, the notion that, I think it's, I think it's my last point, we'll see, um, that the capacity of landscape to engage larger territories, uh, that landscapes, especially a landscape viewed from the perspective of an, e of an ecologist, is not a bounded entity. It doesn't have an inside and an outside. It has to do with interconnected systems that always extend beyond the limits of the site. And of course, we can think of that almost in global terms with uh, the connectivity of, of current day communication technologies. But also, when we think about infrastructure in the city, these systems of movement uh, that have, have really made possible the kind of extended open field, in particular, of the American city. So, if the High Line, I think, is one of the significant built projects of landscape urbanism, uh, I would say this is almost the definitive built example to date of landscape urbanism. This is Manfredi and Weiss's Olympic Sculpture Park in uh, Seattle. Um, and uh, it was finished, I believe, in 2005. And I think one of the things, in fact, that does make the project so successful is the way that it works with the multiple infrastructural systems uh, of the city. Basically, this was a kind of abandoned site on the waterfront. It had highways and railroads running through it. And not only do they make possible uh, new connections, both in this direction across the city, but also down to the waterfront, they've also somehow managed to incorporate the active infrastructures of the city into uh, the logic of the park uh, itself. So those, those somehow sketch out what I think are some of the productive intersections between architecture and landscape, especially at the large uh, ur urban scale. Um, but I think as a kind of personal research project to think about how that might uh, work at the scale, not necessarily of the city or the landscape, but of individual buildings. And in part, what motivated the Landform Building Project was to sort of go back into architecture's own history as a discipline and find a kind of new genealogy for the Landform Building. So going back, for example, to uh, the paintings by uh, Peter Bruegel of the Tower of Babel and the notion uh, of this, this kind of incredible artificial mountain uh, that, that, um, uh, that, that takes architecture to the scale of a geological uh, entity. Um, examples from the 50s and 60s, from Switzerland, from Mexico, um, the examples that were well known in the history of architecture, um, uh, Libra's Villa Malaparte, um, uh, known, I think, to many people from the um, fabulous uh, scenes from uh, Godard's uh, film Contempt. Um, if you haven't seen it, you should, you should see the film. Um, there's, a, there's a great story about the, which, is, which actually is, is, is completely germane to, um, um, to, to, this, uh, to the landform topic. 
Uh, you know, Malaparte's politics were a bit suspect. Uh, he was visited by, uh, by Erwin Rommel right after the Battle of El Alamein in the, in the villa. And Rommel asked Malaparte, uh, did you buy the house ready-made or did you design it for the site? And Malaparte's answer was, the house was ready-made, I designed the site. So, and if you know the way this project relates to, the, to its uh, rocky coast in Capri, it's, it's, although factually incorrect, it, it is somehow correct in, in terms of the way the house works with the landscape. Examples from popular culture. I mean, the, the whole, we have a brilliant article by the Swiss landscape uh, historian theorist, uh, Mikhail Jakob, uh, on the artificial mountain. And this is one of the images. Uh, this is, in fact, Disney. Um, this is Gottfried Baum. Uh, so this idea of writing a kind of new genealogy for the landform in the present. So um, I promised I wouldn't take you through the whole thing, but just to give you an overview, we have these four organizing categories uh, uh, for, the, for the book. Form, scale, atmosphere, and process, each one with a subtitle. So form uh, is, takes its title from the, the, the artificial mountain. And one of the motivations here, actually two, two motivations here. One is to open up the vocabulary, the, the, the typical vocabulary of the landform building. I think some of those slides that I showed at the beginning, I mean, you can almost, you can almost just do it that way. I mean, how many sort of mounded buildings you know, have we seen recently? This idea that you can make a, you make a contact with, with the site through the continuity of the site as it warps up and over the... The, the building, but to suggest that there's another language of landform, which is derived from geological form, it's crystalline form, it's geological form. Uh, this is Moneo's Corsal in, in San Sebastian, um, and uh, Moneo himself talks about the, 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 the building as rocks uh, just tossed onto the beach. Uh, and, and having that, that, that kind of enigmatic quality, a building which, which needs to compete with the natural landscape as opposed to the built uh, landscape. But the other argument here is that you, you could say that uh, going back to the at least to the middle 1990s or even early 1990s, the dominant metaphor in architecture has been uh, the biological. The, the desire to make architecture more lifelike, more fluid, more adaptive. And this has expressed itself in the fluidity of the biomorphic language, but also in the design processes themselves. So that somebody like Greg Lynn, for example, says it's not so much imitating the form of nature as imitating the natural processes of form generation. And again, very important, interesting work, but the suggestion here is that in fact, uh, architecture is situated between the biological and the geological. And the kind of crystalline geological form, the slowness of geology is perhaps uh, a more productive uh, analogy for uh, working uh, with these kinds of natural metaphors. Um, this is one of the buildings that we feature in the book, uh, Mencia and Tunion's uh, Museum of Immigration. Um, in, in Spain based on a, a very similar project of theirs for a museum in, in, in Cantabria, working very explicitly with a kind of geological form, a kind of mountain analogy. This uh, beautiful project by the uh, Colombian architect Giancarlo Mazzanti um, for a library in Medellin in Colombia. Um, and uh, in his project description, for example, he talks about how in the kind of fraught uh, social context of, of Medellin, you, you almost need a kind of geological operation um, to, to transform that, uh, that uh, city. And in fact, I've never seen this building, but uh, um, uh, Barry Bergdahl, a curator at the Museum of Modern Art, was saying he visited this building and these eight-year-old kids come up to him and start explaining the entire logic of the project. So. So uh, this is part of a much larger transformation of Medellin in, in and of itself. It's an interesting issue. Now, each of these sections also has a curated artist project. Um, Tacita Dean, who, who just recently opened this uh, uh, installation at the Turbine Hall in, in uh, the Tate, 
uh, gave us a series of uh, found photographs that she had collected in Berlin in August uh, 2000. Postcards and photographs, you see the back uh, of some of them. Uh, all photographs of ice or snow. Um, and the, the, the sort of the chaotic, formless quality of these landscapes, I think, and, and, and also uh, Tacita always very conscious of the kind of sequencing of these images. Um, now, and of course, another key difference between landscape and architecture is landscapes are bigger than buildings. Uh, buildings typically inhabit the landscape, but there is a category, and we borrowed this term from Kenneth Frampton, of architecture operating at the scale of topography itself, the, the megaform. Uh, of course, this collage of Hans Holein from the 1960s was always very interesting to us. But you could say that in the 60s, here, technology is very much set against nature. And I think with current day work, current day projects, you can begin to imagine a more sympathetic relationship between the landform and uh, nature without moving to an explicit uh, imitation. So this is a project by uh, OMA. Uh, this is Stephen Hall's um, uh, Vanke Center, sometimes referred to as a horizontal skyscraper. It is as long as the Chrysler Building is tall. It's lifted up to create uh, this artificial landscape underneath. So you, 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 you have this building which really activates the space of the city by its, by its horizontal extension and uh, topographical uh, uh, play. Um, Dominique Perrault creating a kind of negative landform for this uh, women's college in Seoul, a uh, project of ours for a landscape project in which we proposed a two and a half kilometer long uh, structure that uh, transforms depending on the particular, uh, both we, 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 we work the bottom, we work the top, and then at a certain point the project kind of dissolves into uh, nature itself. Um, we, we came across these incredible collages by a, a Japanese artist from the 1970s who was using photomontage uh, 40 years ago to create these uh, uh, strange juxtapositions between nature uh, and the city. This category of atmosphere also is very important to us to get away from the notion that the landform is always something from the outside in, that there's a kind of internal interior uh, quality uh, that, that, that also belongs to the logic of, of landscape. This is one of my favorite buildings. This is Villanova uh, Artigas' uh, architecture faculty in Sao Paulo, built um, in the late 1960s, and, and of course, uh, uh, importantly shown here during the student protests in Brazil in the 1970s. Um, interiors that are so large that they take on the qualities of exterior public space. So although the whole thing is enclosed, this becomes exterior to that space, and the building is also therefore used like an exterior public space. So that open programmatic quality of landscape finds its way inside uh, buildings in, in cases like this, or uh, in many cities today in, in, um, in the United States, in Asia, you have these large interconnected urban spaces that take on this quality of a kind of labyrinthine interior where you're disconnected with the exterior. So if one of the experiences of landscape, as opposed to, to architecture typically, is that landscape is immersive. Landscape surrounds you. You don't look at landscape as an object. Um, and I think we can, we can point to a number of uh, architects that are working with that logic. This is Sana's uh, unrealized project in Valencia. Uh, brilliant building uh, by the young Japanese architect, Junji Ishigami. Uh, this library in Tokyo, which again creates an immersive forest-like uh, atmosphere in the interior. The um, installation that Philippe Rahm did for the uh, Biennale in Venice, I think this is 2003, Swiss Pavilion at the Biennale in Venice, uh, recreating the, at the alpine landscape um, f uh, with uh, not, not only the, the brightness of the light, but in this particular case, um, pumping the oxygen out of the air to, to, to simulate the, the high alpine quality. Um, beautiful building that, that Rui Nishizawa did for the Japanese artist uh, Rei Naito, um, where 
Uh, these are these are Ray Naito's works here, uh, and by creating this space that is apparently kind of boundless, you create a kind of a kind of atmospheric framework as opposed to the more conventional framing of the museum for these uh, these works. Um, and here um, we we were very lucky to to get permission to publish some of the photographs of Walter Niedermeyer, the Swiss Italian. Uh, photographer who, who photographs landscape, but he photographs landscape in such a way that he's always mixing the, the man-made presence with the natural presence and getting away from, let's say, the, the, the sort of horizontal uh, uh, horizon-based conception of landscape and creating, again, this kind of immersive, uh, layered uh, concept of, of, the, uh, of the landscape here. And then finally, this notion that we wanted to ask the question, what does it mean to build a landscape? Um, that in, in landscape architecture, you can pile up dirt and you can sculpt the land, and it's not terribly demanding uh, uh, technically, but if you want to do that in architecture, the stakes are different. Uh, it's, uh, and and you, know, you can think about operations such as quarrying. Um, there are two projects we feature here. Uh, uh, the third is a, is a Toyo Ito building. Uh, this is a project by uh, uh, Office Da, uh, Nader Tirani and Monica Ponce de Leon. And uh, Nader was at the original conference. He said something that always stuck with me. He said, well, the ground is very stubborn. You know, the ground, if it's going to be occupiable, it wants to be flat. There's, there's really a limit to what you can do with the ground. So in their case, the landscape is the roof. This is a project uh, in Kuwait uh, for a large mixed-use complex in which they they establish this vast uh, artificial landscape. It's got housing on top, but then uh, there are a whole series of uh, activities that take place down below. And through uh, the modularity of this coffering system, they're able to move from different, uh, from the stadium to the cinemas to the public spaces to housing uh, and, and make the uh, the, to calibrate the, uh, the dimension of that in, in different ways. Um, this, is a build, this is a project which has been shown a lot, but uh, we don't think ever in this way. Uh, this is uh, Sana's uh, EPFL, the project they, they finished in Lausanne a couple of years ago. And uh, we have contributions from the engineers and the, the people who uh, did all the computation work for the, for the form work uh, that, that talk about how do you, again, how do you, what are the technical challenges of, of building an artificial landscape like this? That, that even the proposition, for example, of the kind of continuity of the, of the, of the landscape uh, seen in relationship to, uh, for example, the different uh, uh, zonings for the purpose of structure, um, the fact that there actually are uh, arches built into those floors so, so that within the sort of proposition of smoothness there, the, the, the immense quantities of rebar. So we really wanted to give people a kind of look at the, the, the technical challenges of building uh, landscape. And then we close with a um, friend of mine who runs a program in uh, Texas called Land Arts of the American West, and he and his students did a laser scan of uh, Heiser's double, double negative. Um, and uh, closing with this image of, of Rainer Banham shot by Tim Street Porter um, in Death Valley. The, 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 so, so Banham is both, on the one hand, the kind of emblematic figure for this way of looking at architecture, especially from the kind of technical point of view, um, but also the, 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 the horizontal, ex extensive landscape of the desert. We, 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 we publish in the book a, a, an out-of-print text by, um, by Banham on the vastness of the American desert. Uh, but then, of course, the, the, the profile of the mountains behind him. So, so yeah, so buy the book. Uh, it's, there's a lot more in there. Um, and um, I, I'm going to finish by showing uh, two projects that really take up both the arguments of the lands Landform Urbanism book, but also some of these concerns that even go back uh, further in, in my work. Uh, and um, this, <laughs> I, I, I often use this slide, in fact, uh, as, as, as emblematic of the, the way in which this text, which was 
originally written in, in 95 or 96 called Field Conditions, um, has been reprinted and anthologized and translated really quite a bit, and, and a project from, the, uh, uh, from, from that period, actually. So if there's a, there's a trajectory here where the original work around the idea of field conditions, which led in a fairly obvious way, although it was not obvious to me at the time, I will say, to the work with landscape, the, the notion of the extended horizontal field of landscape, and then coming back by way of the interest in landform building to thinking about individual buildings, but then going back to some of the combinatory logics of the field conditions uh, work. Uh, the, the, the operating principle of the field conditions logic is that you produce difference through the repetition of similar but not identical small-scale elements. So that, that, that rather than difference being produced from a kind of top-down point of view or difference being produced by fragmentation or disjunction, you can, you can produce difference locally uh, while maintaining the coherence of the overall uh, field. So, series of diagrams uh, on the right uh, that were drawn a very long time ago, some of the, some of the points of reference, Le Carusier's uh, uh, Venice Hospital, Melnikov's Sukharov Market, where you see the repetition of this individual unit, but then that sort of larger sense of the interconnected field, um, a certain relationship, obviously at the time, uh, to the questions of the map building, um, and, and the, 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 the proposition for in field conditions was that you create section not so much by stacking, but by, by weaving and interconnecting the, the, the different, different layers. So um, there was also a strong sense in this project, and, and continuing back to the field conditions work, an interest in the provisionality of the diagram. Um, these momentary relationships that are capable of being uh, reshuffled and reorganized. I, I, this is a early piece by the British sculptor Tony Craig, and, and of course I always, always love the caption here. It says, no longer extant. I think about, about two seconds after the photograph was taken, the piece was no longer extant. So, uh, but that, that notion of the, the kind of provisionality of the arrangement of pieces here and their potential to to both, on the one hand, have a very, very clear sort of organizational logic based on the, on the relationship to the body here, but at the same time, always to be reshuffled in, in some sort of way. So I think the open-endedness of the field conditions idea, I mean, at the time, I was talking about relationships to some of the post-minimalist artists like Barry LeVay, uh, was, was always actually quite, quite important. So, okay, so two projects that, that and, and I think the other point that's important to say here it's, uh, this is a competition that we did in 2010, um, and it's not as if we set out to say, oh, well, we're going to do a field conditions museum. It was rather that we looked at the site and the program brief and questions of the relationship between the one and the many of modularity, of repetition, became thematic to the project, and it sent us back to some of that older, older work. So, um, this is a competition for a contemporary art museum, city of Slovenia, uh, sorry, city of Maribor in Slovenia. Uh, Maribor is a very beautiful, intact, uh, historic city, and uh, one of the most characteristic uh, things is these uh, pitched tile roofs. So we felt there was a contradiction implicit in the program brief. On the one hand, they wanted a singular new institutional identity. They wanted a forward-looking progressive building that could, could stand for their commitment to uh, contemporary art and contemporary culture. At the same time, somehow had to be related back to the structure of this historic city. So rather than making any kind of explicit contextual imitations of that form, we, we wanted to look at the logic of the way the city had grown over time and in particular, the dimensions of the lots and the blocks and the way that by the accumulation of buildings, in fact, designed by different architects over time, that the city has both the co overall coherence but local variety. So we were looking for a kind of uh, uh, design logic that would allow us to reproduce that local variety 
with overall coherence that, that's so compelling in the, in the city. Also, the idea that, that built into the um, program, there were some very large public programs that, that, that probably needed to be connected out to the city horizontally, whereas uh, the exhibition space has a fairly natural uh, compartmentalization segmentation based on the cur curatorial needs to have definable spaces and to be able to put those spaces into uh, sequence. So this is one of, one of my earliest sketches for the project, the idea that it could almost be seen as a series of stones just kind of dropped uh, onto the site, to keep that notion of provisionality. Um, this is a phrase that came up in, a, in an interview that I did with uh, Emilia Tuñón and Luz Mencia that Jesus had mentioned, um, where in their work they talked about non-centralized expansive systems capable of becoming specific at any given point. It's not the it's a slightly awkward phrase, but I, it's, I think it's actually quite, quite suggestive. And in fact, for me, a pretty good definition of what I had in mind with field conditions. A, a grid, for example, is a non-centralized expansive system, but a grid is the same at any given point. So this notion that you can produce local difference, that you can become specific locally at those different points, yet maintain that sense of expansiveness and non-hierarchical systems, something that interests me a great deal. This was something a colleague sent to me after the competition uh, when he saw some of these images. Uh, and these are um, diagrams of speciation. This is the Linnaean model. Um, I guess you have to be careful saying this in Sweden. You don't want to criticize Linnaeus. Uh, but th this, is, this is actually somewhat discredited today, the notion that there's a kind of continuous field and you create artificial demarcations. Equally, this sort of archipelago model where the species are not touching or interacting has also been dismissed by the, the biologists. Th these are the two operative models where, where there's, there's local identity but either connection or connectivity uh, between the species group. So um, uh, you could say that, and again, this was something that, that was shown to me after the project, we were trying to do something similar to uh, that. So we worked with a very simple uh, uh, unit, which would be um, uh, repeated, uh, a unit which would have a dimensional relationship to the traditional uh, lot size of uh, Marabor. And by repeating those, we could create this sense of the larger whole that, was, that uh, became very, very s specific locally, yet began to have some uh, larger sense of the identity of the whole. So here, here you see the project in context, uh, and you see the way in which uh, the profile of the roofs, which, which loosely uh, echoes the, 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 the pitches of the historic, but, but more importantly, the way in which the dimensions begin to get carried through into the new space, yet it very clearly defines itself as something uh, new. Also, this sense of a kind of provisionality that, that rather than making kind of sharp sharply defined, contextualized public spaces that by creating this kind of irregular edge, we could, we could uh, create public spaces of, of differing dimensions uh, that would, would, would really re relate more to the historic texture of the city. So you see, you see that in this model here. Now, another important thing, um, after exploring a number of different geometries, we settled on uh, the pentagon uh, for the footprint of this piece. And when you combine pentagons, they don't close pack. Uh, you will necessarily get voids in the system, which we then allowed to bring light down into the project. So this is the project in context with that lower level where everything is, is lifted up and then the, uh, the, the, the sort of collective profile of the new forms uh, from above here in relationship to the waterfront. Um, this is that, that lower level with the open programs, two levels of galleries with, at times, uh, double height spaces, and then uh, the, the, the lighting primarily from above. Um, this is the structural diagram. We take the structure from each of the pentagons down into a single column, kind of umbrella-like column, so that the, the, the point structure marks the location of each of the individual modules. Um, and then you can see the voids opened up by the packing system here. And then the structure creates a kind of lattice work where the individual module sort of disappears into this larger sense of pattern, 
Yet at the same time, that structure is always marking the position of those uh, units in the larger aggregation. So here's a large-scale study model that we made to look at some of the galleries and the nature of that public space, and you see the structure coming down from, from below and the double height galleries there. This is the ground floor plan, uh, which is primarily the, the typical public spaces, library, cafe, uh, bookstore, uh, entries, and so on, um, small auditorium. And you see the way in which this irregular profile creates these little pockets of space uh, and, and creates a kind, of, a kind of porosity to the edge of the project. Here's the view uh, uh, coming up towards the entry. Um, the, uh, there's a very light glass wall which is dropped uh, ar around the bottom so that the, it's, it's as visually open as possible in the horizontal dimension. And then a corrugated uh, zinc rain screen that's wrapped around uh, the, the, the pieces above, again, to reinforce their sense of, of, of a, a collective uh, identity. And then uh, in the gallery level above, of course, the space is more partitioned. Um, these are the uh, galleries that are devoted to the uh, changing exhibitions with, with tall walls and uh, the, the vertical spaces with the light from above. And then on the upper level, this is the permanent collection, which consists of paintings and uh, smaller paintings, drawings, and photographs, typically smaller scale work. You're directly under that articulated roof, but then, of course, there are moments when you can look uh, down uh, to the larger galleries below. So that's, again, the sense of the roof profile and that relationship to the galleries and uh, the public presence of the building especially at night in, in a sense where you only see the skylights as the kind of uh, 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 signal of the gallery space inside, but then this public space uh, that, that can operate in, in connectivity, in continuity with the uh, uh, other uh, public spaces of the city. All right, well, the last project I'm going to show, in, in a sense, sort of brings this problem full scale. Um, if there's a certain logic to working with this relationship between part and whole, collective identity, local differentiation with the, with the project, project of the gallery, these somehow are logical ways of thinking about organizing the space of a museum or a gallery. Uh, this is a competition for an opera house in Busan, uh, Korea. And uh, the, the opera house is almost by definition a singular hierarchical uh, program. Uh, the, the identity of the opera house is somehow built up around the singularity, the, the spectacular excess of, of opera itself. You, you could almost make an argument, you know, there's nothing less field-like than opera. <laughs> that, you know, opera is all about hierarchy and singularity and... So the question was, could we work with this similar methodology and produce a convincing opera house? Um, was, in a way, the kind of task that we, we set ourselves. Um, now, uh, the, just a little bit of the background of the project. Uh, there's, a, there's a vast infrastructural operation of filling. Uh, Busan is a port city that's being... Uh, the, 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 the industrial functions are continuing, but the port is being converted into cultural functions. Uh, phenomenon finding more and more across uh, uh, cities. Uh, we did not design this kidney-shaped island. Uh, that's a given in the, in the uh, uh, um, uh, competition, and this site has been designated for the Opera House. Quite clearly, they have the uh, precedent of the Sydney Opera House in mind. This idea of the Opera House being the kind of singular, iconic, identifying uh, piece for this new cultural district. Now, uh, again, we, we, we wanted to work with that idea, but we wanted to give a different kind of, kind of context for it. Um, we came across this definition, an erratic. An erratic is a, is a geological formation that's in the wrong place. So a rock which has been moved away from its original geological uh, context. Um, again, uh, thinking about the context here with the mountains, the city, and the sea, the idea that a piece of the mountain had found its way to the site between the city and the sea was the kind of operative metaphor, again, working through this, this interest in the geological form. 
Uh, of course, some of the contradictions of, of opera today, uh, there, there you have the, the, the traditional opera with its uh, uh, history of spectacle and excess. Of course, I, I mean, I suppose you could argue that, that Philip Glass and, and uh, Robert Wilson did something field-like in Einstein on the Beach, but uh, this, is, this is also meant to simply be emblematic of the fact that, that uh, there, there, there is contemporary opera being written, contemporary experimental works, and we would need to accommodate this work as much as we would need to accommodate that work. Also, the tensions in the, the expectation of the opera house. I, me I mentioned that, that in all likelihood, the, the, um, the uh, competition organizers had Sydney Opera House in mind. It tr you could try, try this. Google Opera House, click on images. 90 out of 100 images that come up are going to be the Sydney Opera House. It's, it, it has become the emblematic uh, figure of the opera house in the, in the 20th and 21st century. But of course, the, the, the older figure of the opera, uh, the Charles Garnier Paris Opera, is, is, is something we admire for its urban uh, quality. And finally, of course, Busan is a bustling contemporary metropolis, a very modern lifestyle, uh, and we need to key into that, but also the cultural memory. These are traditional Korean stone uh, altars. So I guess the third paradigmatic uh, opera house is, um, is um, Wagner's uh, Beirut. And uh, we, this was also, to some extent, a kind of starting point for us. Uh, in particular, uh, Beirut was never intended to be a permanent structure. It had this kind of uh, barn-like piece that we found very interesting. And we also realized that this little monopoly house piece uh, is a pentagon. It's a five-sided figure when you lay it down on its side. So we thought, well, maybe we can work with that as, uh, as a plan figure. We, you, you know, what, what interests me about the Pentagon, the Pentagon is the simplest figure that destabilizes the geometry of the, of the triangle or the square. Uh, with that one added side, a whole, uh, the, 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 the fundamental relationships become unstable and dynamic. So, for example, when you start combining them, you get this kind of rotational geometries, and then that produced a, a larger figure, same, same geometry, different scale, which could accommodate the hall, and then we add pieces to accommodate all the technical complexities of the opera and additional public programs. So this is the fundamental plan organization that's based on this simple re repetition of the model module. Now, each of those figures, we then take the uh, vertexes of, of the pentagon, and we can slide those up and down in space, but because of the geometry, we're always creating triangulated surfaces, so they're easy to describe and they're easy to build. But we can uh, create a very high degree of variety uh, with this very simple starting point. This is, again, something that interests me. You take simple systems, simple rules, that, that in turn produce uh, complexity. Um, there's another move, which is we take one of those, we rotate 90 degrees, and then with a similar sort of shaping, we're able to start occupying uh, the upper levels of the building. So that, that the, again, the building doesn't become a kind of simple object in space, but something that you can walk on and inhabit at many different uh, levels. So, so the, these, these are really the, 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 the sort of most important diagrams of the project. That, that, that kind of explain the logic of the part-to-whole relationships here, where we can start with many parts, and they together form some sense of a kind of complex whole that is adequate to the kind of singular hierarchical identity of the opera house itself. So we start with these small pieces, we aggregate them according to that plan logic, and then that upper level piece comes in, you can see the way it, it carves out uh, occupiable terraces above, actually one here, one here, and then uh, a kind of plinth piece which ties it to the ground and accommodates some of the larger programs down below. So th there's, there's a sense in the final thing, on the one hand, of the kind of recognizability of the modular piece, but then other moments where it simply sort of disappears into this more complex geometric logic. The other thing I would say is that, that that was a response to the complexity of the program itself. I'm, I'm not going to go through all these individual pieces, but I, I think the diagram makes clear that an opera house today is made up of many, many different pieces, some of them with very, very specific uh, uh, technical needs that 
that necessitate this much more complex kind of envelope for the project. Uh, we do spend a lot of time on the plans. This is the final uh, plan for the main public area with the auditorium, the wings and the backstage, the rehearsal rooms that feed that, and then the realm of the public uh, taking place here, uh, the foyer space that looks back over the city, and then on the upper levels of the building, we carve out these two very large terraces which include outdoor performance space, uh, so that in the interval, for example, you could get up and look back uh, out over the sea uh, to the city beyond, uh, including uh, uh, outdoor performances and projections, and then the, the offices and restaurants uh, in the bridge pieces that, that loop over that. Uh, uh, so this view of that waterfront and, and the skin and the big void and the, the kind of iconic uh, images of the opera house here. Um, now, um, our sort of rules for doing competitions, uh, we've won some, we've lost more than we've won, uh, but always we look for competitions that help drive the work uh, forward. And then what we do in the competitions has a presence in uh, the smaller scale work. Um, this is a house which I built uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, the client is a painter, um, and uh, this, is the, this is the built project. Basically from here over, is the original house, um, very horizontal, working with the landscape, consistent with my interest in landscape at the time. And um, the client is spending more time there and, and uh, asks for a studio um, uh, that she could work up there as well as her studio in the city. So we're, we're counterposing a piece, a vertical piece to the horizontality of the earlier piece. Uh, and it's clearly uh, this was designed right after the Marabor competition, and I can tell you we basically said, well, let's build a little piece of Marabor. Uh, we lost the competition, but let's build one module here for, for uh, the studio. Here's, uh, again, a kind of collage. This is the interior, so existing house, new studio, and uh, the kind of linking piece here. It's a couple of Marilyn Minter's uh, paintings right here. Um, this is the existing house, and uh, once more, not surprisingly, the, pan, the plan is a pentagon. But in her case, not, not only do, is there this idea that, that with that additional one side, you destabilize the, the, the square, but in her case, um, she works with projection, so uh, we needed the additional distance, and that also created a single long uh, painting wall for the very large-scale works that she uh, does. So. Um, so there you see that uh, Pentagon footprint of the house, the existing house here. Um, the site is quite steep. It's being built very slowly and meticulously by a guy who started off life as a cabinet maker. He's building it almost like a piece of furniture. You can see the site itself is quite steep, and the house has a, the, 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 the studio has a very strong presence uh, from below. Uh, and then up above, it relates more to the domestic scale of the existing house with the new entry piece here. Uh, and that's pretty much the current state as of about uh, a, a week ago. So I, I end with this project really in, in an effort to, to, uh, to describe a process where if, if in that earlier work, the landscape work and the building work, we're operating in slightly different registers. Uh, I think with these more recent projects and the interest in landform building and geological form, you begin to see a kind of convergence between uh, the larger scale work, the interest in landscape, and the way in which that can play itself out in, in a very small, very particular project. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take a few questions if there are. Yes. Sure.
<laughs> well, the, the, the question referred to a, mar a remark that I made about the, the chapel that, um, that it was not so much a proper building, in part because it didn't have electrical systems, glass in the windows, uh, mechanical ventilation, and so on. And uh, I mean, I think uh, on the one hand, I sort of, I sort of stand by the, the remark, but I, I, I appreciate your pointing out the, the, that, uh, because I, I think on the one hand, it's not a building in the sense that it doesn't create um, a sharp demarcation between inside and outside, between conditioned inside and nature outside. And, um, but I think being a little bit more, more precise, uh, I, I would say it, it is the physical porosity of the, of, the, of the building, the fact that when it rains, the rain comes right in, uh, the fact that the, the external pavings move, move right into the building. So, so, I mean, I think in that sense, I mean, again, I wouldn't want to force the landscape analogy there um, because I think there's a, there's a history of this kind of type, which is a pavilion type, basically. That, that um, I think the difference is, for, for me, the pavilion type has not always, but very often insisted on a kind of floating roof, and it has porosity because of the horizontal connectivity. This, this is very clearly a kind of demarcating boundary, but then we worked to make that boundary very, very porous. So, so I think the, the, the idea that, and also, you know, it's just, I mean, again, it was, I mean, I think I'm expressing a little bit, especially in the US, I mean, you know, we're dealing with energy, and I'm sure here too, I mean, you're dealing with energy codes and, and uh, e even this desire to make buildings more and more, um, uh, more, more better, better and better sealed, you know, um, and this this notion that you you could you could really open the building up to the elements in that way, uh, as almost as a kind of elemental building gesture was for us. I mean, that that was the opportunity of working in a place like the Philippines. I mean, that building would have been impossible in the states. Uh, is this right? To, to follow from that, I suppose that um, one thing I find interesting about the landform building um, trope, or whatever you call it, is which I think you I thought it was very beautiful. You talked about this this issue of the inside. Sure. That the inside you create probably has to be, or maybe not. Or this is a question, but maybe requires a great deal of artificial tempering. I mean, sure. you get. There's a whole issue about ventilation, light, sure. and non-porosity. Yeah. Um, and I think that's an interesting aspect of it, which yeah. you might want to say something about in relation to that. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I think if, if you, in, in a sense, combine some of the different, different uh, references there, that, that, I mean, if, we, if you begin with the notion, I mean, historically, we know, for example, that, that um, landscape painting doesn't emerge historically until... Uh, you, you actually have cities, and the landscape is defined as, as other to the city. So, so even, even, in, even in, the, in the earliest sort of art historical context, the, the, the landscape is a kind of artificial construction. So, uh, so I mean, if, if, I mean, I was, where was I? I was lecturing in Chile, and I said, you know, I mean, there's, I mean, certainly in Europe and the United States, there are no landscapes that are not in some ways marked by the presence of, of, of humans. And, Maybe in Chile there are landscapes like that, but uh, um, so uh, if, if I mean if we think of, of landscape certainly not not uh, as as something that 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 always is some form of artificial construction, and then you you begin to sort of extend that idea to thinking about um, the the sort of immersive uh, quality of the contemporary city, for example. Uh, you know, my friend Bob Somel has pointed out that today you can, you can put the word scape after almost anything. You know, information scape, data scape, brand scape. You know, we've, we've heard, you know, it's just so. so but but I, I think that actually does conceal something where this sense of flows and connectivity, immersive spaces, that, that really, I think, belong to the experience of the contemporary city in a very kind of fundamental way. 
And so part of it is thinking about the way that that might become uh, more thematic in, in, in architecture. Also, I think as a way of dealing with, with a kind of larger scale. I mean, I mean you know, certainly, uh, I mean, there are many other examples than the ones I showed, but you know, the proliferation of these, of these large semi-enclosed spaces within, within the city uh, as, as something that's, that's neither properly interior nor properly exterior. We don't really have a, uh, we don't really have a language for describing these, these spaces yet. So, so there's a kind of intuition that some of the language of landscape could, could potentially be useful for, for talking about these, these new spaces. But in their urban context, in their artificial context, so in, in other words, the, 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 the landscape is not tied to the presence of something green. Landscape is tied much more to the sense of a kind of immersive space and uh, the artificiality of the, of the atmosphere. So, yeah. Hello, Stan. <coughs> uh, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. I think it's very relevant uh, aspects of land form and how landscape ties into urbanism and architecture. I wonder about um, your geological reference. Uh, and the, you talked about the crystal in the beginning. Sure, sure. Is it so that uh, in your architecture, uh, especially your building projects, is it more, is it the figure of the geological formation, the figure of the mountain, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or is it the aggregation of crystalline sure. structure, which sure. is different kind of scapes? No, no, exactly, yeah. exactly. No, no, I think this is very, I mean, um, um, for for me, it it's the part to whole relationships that are implied in 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 uh, in in the that as a kind of operating metaphor, more than the 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 figure of the mountain as a as an outcome of that that operation. Um, and I mean, I you know, look, um, I I think I think it's very important. Um, I mean, I think we're I think we're beyond the naivete that says that you you set a kind of um, automatic operation in in uh, to to work, and then you're you're surprised by the outcome. You know, I th I think we all, especially with with digital tools today, it, it the the possibility of tweaking the diagram, testing the outcome, going back, tweaking the diagram, and getting the outcome you desire. I mean, it's it's you know it's 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 not a it's not a linear process anymore. So. But but I think it, it is important. So, you know, of course we're conscious of the of the potential of the image in that sense. But but I can honestly say, for example, with the the, you know, you know look, I, I mean, this also has to do with the the structure of the office and the collective nature of of work. Uh, you know, I was honestly surprised by the form of the of the Busan Opera House. That you know that the 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 combinatory logic and the plan logic was mine, and then there kids in the office that start producing stuff, and it's like, okay, yeah, that, that follows the logic, but it wasn't what I would have said, but let's go with it, you know? I mean, I mean it <coughs> it's important to say that, you know, all this work is developed, I mean, you know, with, with teams of people and many, many people contributing, and, you know, in a way, I mean, I think I'm not the first person to say this, but I think the notion that an architect is not a, a kind of singular author, but, you know, a bit like a film director who is setting up certain conditions and then seeing what those conditions generate. So, so I, I mean, I think to that extent it's also, I mean, similar. That's something I think you could say we learn from the very large-scale urban work, where you, 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 you can't pretend to control every little corner of a, of, a, of a big project. Instead, you can set up a series of rules, a series of conditions, and you can see what that produces within the kind of, kind of collective intelligence of the studio. Hi. Um, a quick question. Uh, you speak of by using simple forms and tweaking them a little uh, can generate a certain complexity in the in the design in the overall design. And I was actually wondering whether n complexity is a necessity in landform buildings. Yeah. I mean, look. It's probably. Um, um, uh, Bruno Latour, among others, makes a difference between complex and complicated. And uh, I, I like to speak about qualitative complexity as opposed to quantitative complexity. So, you know, a car or an airplane, for example, is a very, very complex piece of machinery, but it's complex because it has a lot of parts. And uh, so, uh, again, that's, 
if you wanted to use the other language of complicated versus, versus complex. Where, whereas certainly natural systems, social ecologies, are often produce complex effects with a series of, of very, very, very simple rules. So, I mean, um, uh, I'm not quite sure where your question is sort of coming from or where it's going, but, um, uh, and, you know, I think in the sort of spectrum of the world, I probably, you know, lean a little more towards, away from, let's say, complexity for its own sake. Um, I mean, I would say that, that, that natural systems, natural ecologies are complex dynamic systems, but they're complex dynamic systems because they operate with uh, the, the uh, interaction of, of, of multiple, multiple variables. Um, but I'm certainly not a proponent of complexity for its own sake. Uh, I think, think and, and again, that's a little bit, I mean, um, the Opera House project is as complex as it is because the program, the given program is, is quite, quite complex. Now, sure, could the whole thing have been housed in a very simple enclosure? Probably. Um, um, you know, it's not the, not the direction we, we chose to, to go. There's another rule that I like to use that, that comes from out of my interest in, in infrastructure, um, which is that, that in infrastructural systems, in sort of engineer's logic, there's a kind of default regularity, or uh, so you know. So if so if an, if you if you're building a highway across the desert, you're going to make a straight line. But that same en you know when when the highway comes to a mountain range, that same engineer has absolutely no problem introducing a high degree of complexity into the system because it's responding to complex conditions. Um, now I think every architect, in a way. If, if you want to invent a pretext for complexity, you can invent a pretext for complexity. But I think if you sort of use that notion of kind of the default condition of regularity as a kind of test, you, you're only putting as much complexity into the building as, as is required by, by the sort of site or the program. I mean, in, in Montana, for example, they found that when they built straight highways for hundreds of miles, people would fall asleep. Uh, so they started introducing, even in the flat landscape of the plains, they started introducing big curves into it. So, so you can always find a pretext, but I think for, for us that kind of working principle of default regularity is one that we, we, uh, we, we pay attention to. So. Okay, now it's time to thank you again. I think it was really, really wonderful lecture, Stan. I'm sorry to tell you uh, you have more presents. <laughs> So you have to carry to overseas, to New York. <laughs> All right. Well, so thank you. I want to give you the magazine of the architecture school here. Good, good. And a bit about Swedish modernism, one of the ah. lectures you have edited. Perfect. Thank you, Stan. Now we continue the venue with a bit of wine outside. Thank you. Okay.